Thanks very much, uh, Vanda, for this kind introduction. And uh, let me begin by uh, thanking the organizers of the conference for inviting me here today and present my research. I was especially pleased to receive this invitation because I was a recipient of the Western Front Association PhD grant in 2020. So it's my opportunity to say thank you to the association and also show them what their money was funding all that, uh, all that time. No pressure. <laughs> um, so today I'd like to talk to you about innovation and learning in the Russian army, 1913, uh, 1915, and maybe a little bit in 1916. Because the thing is, and like on the Western, the Western Front, they got locked into trench stalemate already in uh, end of 1914. The Eastern Front saw maneuver warfare for longer. Uh, and it was not until autumn 1915, after the great retreat, so-called great retreat of, uh, of the Russian army, after the devastating Austro-German offensive in uh, Goyese Tarnovo, um, that the Eastern Front st stabilized and began, began to resemble somewhat the, kind of the, the trench lines of uh, France and Flanders. So thus, Russian army had an opportunity to fight the maneuver war, the war that it was preparing to fight, for uh, about uh, a year. So and today in this talk, I would like to explore in detail so how the Russian army fought in 1914, 1915, and what it has learned or not learned, as we will see, and um, how it eventually adapted to the trench warfare at the end of uh, 1915. A quick disclaimer, so I will talk about Russian army, not Russian navy. Uh, that was ran by separate ministry and separate naval general staff. And I was also focused on the Eastern Front. Uh, Russia obviously fought on, uh, in the Caucasus as well, which is very interesting theater to explore. And there are many parallels in terms of kind of innovation and learning and tactics um, in the Caucasus and in the Eastern Front. But for the sake of simplicity and your time and my time, we're going to omit it today. So let's begin by looking at what Russian army looked like in 1913. It was largest standing army in Europe. And uh, in the eyes of the allies and some of the enemies, Russia had apparently inexhaustible manpower resources that gave um, kind of a rise to lots of expectations, especially in, in France, about what Russia was able to deliver uh, in, uh, at the beginning of the war. So let's see here, for instance, that's a cover of the Scientific American magazine in September 1914 that shows the, the manpower resources of all the fighting armies. Uh, but even if we consider that the trained men uh, mentioned here on this, uh, in this picture is the number of men that could be called up, almost 6 million men that Russia is kind of represented here, um, as it was, was a gross overestimation of the Russian strength and let alone an accurate estimate, estimate of how many men Russia was actually fielding in September 1914. Um, uh, by 1914, after a series of military reforms that followed the Russo-Japanese War, the Russian Imperial Army numbered uh, 1,423,000 men in peacetime. Uh, after the mobilization, it was supposed to reach 2.5 million men, so half of what kind of the Scientific American was, uh, even less than half uh, of what the Scientific American magazine uh, was imagining and the allies who represented Russia as a steamroller um, were imagining as well. Out of these... Uh, 1.5 million men in peacetime, 40,000 were officers. During the wartime, it was supposed to be increased by to 80,000 officers, and it's a staggeringly small number. It's a really kind of trademark of Russian army that not having enough officers in the NCO uh, in, uh, in the unit. So it's one officer per 32 men, one of the, uh, one of the lowest in uh, European army. Uh, speaking of the army and the training, so Russian army was indeed a conscript army. So or, technically, every man after reaching the age of 21 years was supposed to uh, do a three-year mandatory military service. But on practice, um, there were many exemptions in this um, based on class. So aristocrats didn't do that. Often the, the people who, after doing their course in universities, were able to, to be exempt of it or doing a reduced kind of service time. Only sons and still breadwinners, breadwinners were not conscripted. Um, and so on. So in fact, Russia only had 0.35% uh, of population in training every year, which was uh, twice as low as 0.75% uh, in uh, France and, sli only s and slightly higher than Austria-Hungary, which had 0.29%. Uh, so it's not a lot of people being actually uh, trained every year and the quality of the people who were conscripted was also questionable because most uh, m of the Russian uh, conscripts were peasants and the army in this three-year 
service uh, in the army serve not not only as a kind of opportunity to train uh, the recruits, but also an opportunity to give them basic literacy skills and inculcate loyalty to the Russian state and, and the monarchy. Um, yet, uh, in 1914, almost 43% of the Russian soldiers uh, were illiterate. So, the kind of, again, the quality, speaking of the quality of the, uh, of, of the manpower resources, in this picture, I believe Scientific American is trying to present uh, Russia as, you know, as a kind of in a Cossack uniform, but in real life it looked quite different. So this is, uh, this is a Cossack soldier, so a light cavalry soldier dressed in a typical uh, khaki uniform of the Russian army at the time. Uh, most of the, both cavalrymen and infantrymen were uh, equipped with a Mosin Nagan rifle and the artillery were, uh, was equipped with 76 millimeter field gun that you can see um, here in a picture. In terms of kind of quality of equipment and characteristic is quite similar. The, the, the Russian equipment was comparable to um, other weapons of the European armies and the, but the greatest issues in the, uh, issue in the Russian army was just simply not enough of that equipment. So if we look at the numbers of artillery pieces per units, we'll see that uh, in the Russian army they were kind of much uh, lower and were mostly attached to kind of divisional artillery. So for comparison, 48 light guns per division, uh, comparing to 72 artillery pieces in, uh, in Germany. And uh, uh, most of artillery that Russia had was the, these light guns. So they simply didn't have enough uh, heavy artillery, as we will see uh, kind of later. They didn't have enough kind of even uh, uh, artillery to break through the fortified positions um, of, uh, or of the fortress of Chemischel and the fortified positions that the Germans later will build at the front in 1916. And this attitude with having kind of low number of guns and having most of the uh, most of the artillery pieces being piece of in light artillery reflected very much the dominant trends that existed in Russian military thought at the time that was codified in a field service regulation issued in 1912. The field service regulations accept in 1912, so that was very much a product of that military reform that was going in Russia after the defeat in the, in the Russo-Japanese war and uh, was very much a, uh, a product of it but also ha had a very kind of strong kind of Russian kind of characteristic in it. Uh, so it was, um, uh, like many armies at the time, it gave preference to offensive action. So supposedly the army was supposed, um, was um, uh, meant to go on offensive uh, as, uh, as long as it was uh, possible. Uh, however, it allowed, as a lesson of the Russo-Japanese War, it allowed opportunity for defensive action and suggested that defense must be built around 45 position dug into the ground. So kind of there was uh, there was a description of, of the trenches and, uh, and, and strong points, but again, it was not quite the trenches that kind of we, used to th kind of we, we usually think when we think about the Western Front. So it's mostly kind of strong points that were spread, uh, spread around in, in the field. They're flanking each other, so it's not one continuous line uh, of, um, uh, of trenches. Uh, and that was very much the approach that Russians took in, in the first year of the war as well. So kind of building this kind of uh, strong fortified, uh, relatively uh, strong fortified positions uh, that would allow to keep German advance, but as we'll see, that didn't didn't help in 1915. Also, what specifically characteristic characteristic of Russia that it gave primacy to infantry. So the field service regulation po postulated that the attack and the offensive should be carried out by infantry, and all other arms should supported by all means and uh, selflessly help. Self, that's a quote, selflessly help the artillery in time of need, uh, uh, infantry in time, uh, in time of need. So in, uh, field service regulation saw the, in, in this respect, they saw the uh, infantry kind of as a main instrument of an attack and uh, artillery was, was meant to be used only to support infantry in the attack, that meaning that they, artillery, light artillery was supposed to fight at the enemy's infantry and not enemy's artillery uh, pieces. It was actually interestingly, and it's also kind of a, a very characteristic trait of the Russian army at the time, the field service regulation offered certain flexibility. So there was a, a phrase in the regulation saying that the, uh, the officer should use the regulations uh, kind of wisely following the, the phrase of Peter the Great, do not hold the to the regulations as a blind holds the wall. So kind of there was this opportunity for improvisation, but, as we, uh, but that actually was not uh, 
often uh, was not heeded by some of the high, uh, some of the commanders who, in certain cases, insisted on following the regulations word by word. Um, all being said, it's uh, the existence of the field service regulation didn't, and the, the, accept, uh, the, kind of the uh, acceptance of the field service regulations in 1912 did not go unchallenged in, in, the, in the Russian uh, military establishment at the time because it was split in different schools of thought. So the factionalism is a big trait of the, of the Russian army pre-1914. And we can identify roughly three groups uh, uh, of, uh, of this kind of military establishment thought. First were academics, or, uh, including General Sukhumlinev, the war minister at the time, who pushed through acceptance of the field service regulation, uh, regulations, who believed in moderacy and change and the need to follow certain rules of military science, very much in kind of following the approach of Antoine uh, Henri Jomini, who was, uh, by the way, the founder of the Russian Academy of the General Staff because he transferred to the Russian uh, service in 18. 13 and who was a great kind of proponent of this uh, very kind of rationalist approach that you can develop a universal laws of war. So that was um, popular among certain groups of, of uh, Russian military at the time as well. A uh, second group would be Russian nationalists. So those who believe that Russia has its own, you know, unique approach uh, to war called Russian art of war. Uh, it was a theory based on works of uh, General Suvorov. General Suvorov is an 18th century Russian general, most famous for his victory, uh, uh, victories over Ottomans, who famously quipped that the bullet is a fool and bayonet is a fi fine fellow. So you can see kind of the whole kind of prime, where the primacy of infantry is coming from. And uh, the, that, that, that group actually was quite, uh, um, quite uh, popular, especially among the general public and the kind of lower level uh, officers, because lots of kind of, you can see lots of kind of military magazines, especially not the, the the most professional ones. They were kind of promoting this idea of the of the of the Russian way of war. And finally, the Westerners, the smallest group, and maybe the best place prior 1912. The group uh, also referred as Young Turks for their zeal to change things, and they were kind of advocating to use the lessons uh, from the Western military thought to prepare the Russian army to the coming war. That included kind of change in technology and included. Uh, increase in uh, in firepower. Uh, so those kind of you know squabbles between those groups prevented Russia uh, Russian army to create a unified military doctrine prior to 1914, and uh, all the debate around military doctrine ended in 1912 with Nicholas II slashing the Gordian knot uh, by proclaiming that military doctrine consists of uh, doing everything which I order. So this is um, actually kind of brings us nicely to another kind of element of the Russian Imperial Army pre-1913 is the question of uh, leadership. So obviously Nicholas II served in, uh, in the army in his 20s in the Guards uh, Infantry Regiment and he was very fond of the army and specifically the Guards Corps for the rest of his life. So he was trying to take an active part in life uh, of the army, but mostly kind of in, kind of in symbolical roles, so attending parades, maneuvers in this case, this is like yearly maneuvers in the, uh, on the training ground in Krasnoye Silo near, near St. Petersburg, which he attended every year. But in fact, kind of on day-to-day -day running of the army uh, was assigned to professionals, so war ministry and the general staff. But that kind of didn't prevent Nicholas II, as you, you see with the case of military doctrine, intervene from, uh, from time to time with, uh, with his uh, opinions. And... Um, Russia didn't have, a, until, until July 1914, Russia didn't have uh, a field command regulation. So they didn't, have, didn't agree on how the army is going to be run in uh, wartime. And the design of these regulations initially suggested that the emperor would take the supreme command of the army and then once again be kind of symbolic leader of the army and delegate the kind of day-to-day -day operational command to military professionals. But what happened that uh, Nicholas II delegated uh, the supreme command to his more popular cousin, uh, General uh, Grand Duke uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich, that you can see here. So he was uh, popular among the army, popular um, uh, in troops and in the general public as well. He was seen as, you know, old school kind of cavalry commander who was an inspector general of the armed forces and kind of got this uh, reputation of being strict, but just, just something that Russia needs uh, in time of war, but that created a kind of complication uh, in uh, in kind of in command structure. So, because 
the emperor was staying in St. Petersburg and the, the uh, rest uh, and the uh, supreme commander was staying in the field headquarters, also known as Stavka, uh, closer to the front. And the country was basically split in two areas, the front area and the rear area. And the front area was run by supreme commander and his field headquarters. And the rear so uh, was run by the kind of peacetime uh, um, uh, cabinet and the emperor himself. So there was kind of a rift in conflict and who's, who has... Uh, more power. And another uh, kind of issue that was that arose from this hastily accepted field command regulations is the creation of uh, the front. So front in, um, uh, in Russian terminology, it's a term designated group of armies because the Russian army was, uh, uh, after mobilization was supposed to number 2.5 million men, as I already said, it was supposed to fight on a front that was several thousand kilometers long. Um, so the kind of the point was to split it in two big groups which will fight on different theaters. One will fight Germany, another will fight Austria-Hungary. And uh, the field command regulations postulated that, of course, the supreme commander will have his field headquarters, but each of the fronts will have their own commanders and they also will have their own headquarters of the same structure as the field headquarters of the supreme commander. So, and they delegated them lots of operational planning and lots of kind of, de um, uh, kind of intelligence uh, functions and as well as, uh, as we will see, like instructions and, and manuals function was delegated to the front. Uh, to the fronts that kind of created a challenge in, 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 in command structure because most of the big decisions, the Supreme Command, Nikolai Nikolaevich was actually, despite his kind of very decisive appearance, he was not a very decisive character, so he preferred to kind of confer with his front commanders before any decisions was made, and that led to kind of first uh, took time to kind of to, to, to negotiate any meaningful military decision, and secondly, it led to the front commanders having a lot of power in actual kind of decision making in the Russian army. So before we jump into 1914, just to quickly sum up, uh, so this very long kind of uh, intro uh, into what Russian army looked in 1913, so to sum up, so Russian army went into the war with imperfect command structure, with good infantry, but with not a lot uh, that kind of did not, lacked in training somewhat and lacked in quality, didn't have enough officers, didn't have enough heavy artillery and relied on kind of light artillery to support the infantry in attack, which was kind of supposed to be the main, uh, the main arm to carry most um, of the operations. So obviously, uh, as uh, I think uh, all, all the people gathered here today know that the 1914 for Russia began with a terrible disaster at Tannenberg, and uh, all of that tactics can, did not necessarily pay off. But, um, and lots been written about it, so, but today I'd like to focus on uh, another operation and battle that was happening at the same time as the Tannenberg, and that's the uh, battle in Galicia, where actually Russia was successful, so I think, and I thought it would be a good example to see what Russian army uh, was uh, capable of. So the Russian plan in 1914 was to attack two enemies simultaneously. Not necessarily the most brilliant plan, but the plan that was a result of a compromise between different factions. Again, coming back to factionalism, there were two groups in the Russian general staff who had different ideas which enemy Russia is supposed to attack first, Germany or Austria-Hungary. The, those who wanted to attack Austria-Hungary, led by General Alexeyev, who will become the, um, the chief of staff of Southwestern Front, so the, the front that was supposed to uh, attack um, Austria-Hungary believed that Austria-Hungary is a weaker enemy. So Russia can knock it out first and then deal with Germany. And those who wanted to attack Germany, led by the uh, quartermaster general of the general, uh, general staff and de facto kind of the chief strategist of the Russian army pre-1914, General Danilov, thought that uh, Russia should kind of try to attack Germany first before, whilst Germany is busy fighting France, so they will try to kind of inflict on them um, a defeat before they can turn around and, 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 and strike them. So um, two attacks were happening simultaneously on, kind of, on, a, on the whole of the Eastern Front. But uh, the thing is that this factionalism continued even on questions on, on where exactly Russia supposed to attack on South, um, Southwestern Front, so here. So basically the same, kind of the, the same factions were split. General Danilov wanted the, most of the troops to attack in the north 
of Galicia Susan protecting the, the Russian operations in Germany and kind of, uh, protecting his potential operation in Poland, so a thrust from Warsaw to Berlin, which never happened but existed in his mind. And General Alexeyev, who was an actual kind of chief of staff of the Southwestern Front, wanted the, the Russian troops to attack Austrians in the eastern Galicia and try to push them towards the Carpathian Mountains. So once again, two offensives were happening simultaneously and the troops were split. It almost turned into another disaster at Tannenberg. So the Austrians managed to, in, like in the 20s uh, of August 1914, the Austrians managed to inflict kind of a big a, a blow on the Russian Fourth Army here, where you can see the, the Austrian thrust here quite nicely. So they uh, push into the positions of the Russian Fourth Army, which begins to fall back to the town of Lublin here, opening the flank of the Russian Fifth Army here. So kind of ha opening for a possibility for Fourth Army being encircled and destroyed, so Tanberg uh, number two. But what the, uh, the Fifth Army does, that led was by Harden, Commander General Pleve, they decide to to hold on and uh, he quickly maneuvers his troops to kind of create a defensive kind of semicircle. Here, the cause here, you can I have another map. So hopefully it'll be better to form a defensive semicircle around the town of Komarov and hold on the Austrian troops for six days until, so from 25th of August until 31st of August, uh, for, to hold on for six days, creating a defensive line along, along the Vistula, so just enough to get the reinforcements that kind of stuff could by that time click that the things are not going very well, so send the reinforcements to help, to help the southwestern uh, front. So um, this was according to Stephen Walsh, who recently written about it in English. It uh, was a key strategic and operational tactical moment in the 1914 campaign for Russia because that kind of led to the avoidance of defeat and by kind of in the north, so if we return to the map here, by ex uh, Austrians extending their forces, kind of dragging them in the north, they opened a possible, they opened, they gave an opportunity for the Russian troops attacking Galicia from the east to kind of push them to the Carpathian Mountains and on the 3rd of September, the Russian army seized uh, Lvov, so the, the kind of the capital town of Galicia at uh, the time. So this is actually a good example of what Russian uh, army and more specifically Russian infantry can do if led by kind of competent, resilient commanders such as General Alexeyev of Southwestern Front, Pleve of the 5th Army and General Gorbatovsky here of the 19th Corps that took most of the fighting uh, and took most of the casualties uh, at the time. This is a uh, general plebe. So uh, infantry proved to be able to kind of withstand long marches and be able to quick uh, to um, have uh, to quickly maneuver on the on the ground. And even artillery proved to be good. So later, some German observers commented that it was uh, good in the long distance fire because the most of the Russian artillery was positioned kind of way behind uh, behind the lines, but was able to inflict kind of enough damage on Austrian infantry for it to be felt. So. For the rest of the 1914, similar frontal collisions and counter battles for strategic, operational, tactical initiative continue. So this kind of uh, attempts to outthink, out of maneuver, out fight the enemy uh, continued until November 1914, the Battle of Lodz, kind of an attempt, uh, a German attempt once again to kind of uh, in the giant pincer movements around Russian troops in Poland, but that failed. Germans were pushed out of Poland, but at the same time, by kind of in this attack, Russians were unable. To, uh, were prevented from launching their offensive, kind of that, ex uh, that I mentioned already, the offensive on Berlin. Why kind of the, uh, the action stopped by November 1914, slowed, sign or significantly slowed down, because it became clear that the, mun the use of munitions was much higher than expected. So that's the beginning of the munitions crisis. And the uh, shortage was so severe that Russia had to postpone all the offensive operations by November 1914. So that would be kind of one would think that it would be good kind of time to stop and think and well, well, slow down and think about the lessons that Russian army learned in, 19, um, in 1914 in this first months of uh, fighting. But Stavka was not really interested in that. It was too busy looking for munitions in Russia and abroad. So it delegated this question to the commands of uh, the fronts and uh, armies. So in theory, that offered uh, flexibility that could be beneficial in an army fighting in a very long uh, uh, front, which had different geographical features, so obviously fighting in the Carpathian Mountains and uh, 
fighting in Eastern Prussia had very different kind of different traits. But in practice, it overcomplicated an already unwieldy Russian command structure and made it difficult to kind of to accept any uniform guidance in in the Russian army. So, for instance, after the Germans began to use chemical weapons on the Eastern Front, which happened in already in January 1915, kind of smaller um, uh, gas attacks happened on the Eastern Front already uh, on 31st of January 1915, different armies, so not even the front level kind of guidance, different armies began to use different solutions to kind of protect the troops from uh, the chemical warfare. Uh, and be they began to procure these solutions separately. So they uh, got in touch with the civilian officials and became, like, began their own separate kind of lines of supply of um, uh, chemical uh, pr protective uh, chemical protective equipment. So here is the picture. Obviously, it's a stage stage picture, and it's 1916. Uh, but you can see the wide array of gas masks that were used in uh, in one unit in on uh, on the Eastern Front. And that kind of gives you the idea that different kind of different armies and uh, different fronts handle it differently. So with the lack of guidance coming from Stavka, the fronts had to recur to their own source of information. And most of the information at the time, so early 1915, late 1914, was coming from the foreign armies, either from the uh, German army, they didn't really use Austro-Hungarian guidance, uh, but the German documents that were kind of found and captured or killed, German officers, or the guidance that was sent by the Allies, predominantly the French, who were very keen to share the information uh, with the Russian army, who they thought that kind of will be struggling and fighting. So the uh, Russian military attaché in France, General Ignatiev, was like, had access to lots of French manuals and guidance and instructions that he was sending to uh, Stavka, predominantly uh, via either special envoys or even kind of in some cases uh, telegraphs. So he was kind of typing and uh, ciphering um, uh, French guidance uh, in, in the telegrams. So this is a good example of one of the documents that he sent. It was the French uh, order of uh, offer of General Joffre on 20th of May 1915, so preceding the French attack on, on the Western Front. And here is a little mark that says it was translated. So it was translated and sent out to the troops. But in most cases, Stavka didn't bother with translating those documents. It was just sending it down the chain of command, what they thought was useful, so that they translated only those kind of handful that they thought was useful. So for instance, the table of distances of the German artillery or the instructions on how to locate the artillery using the sand raging technique, something that they thought that was quite kind of re applicable on, on the Russian front, but in most cases, it was just kind of passed down. Uh, the chain of command. And so that opened the possibility of different kind of approaches uh, to this uh, information. Some chose to rework it, translate it, print it as separate manuals, uh, so for troops to be able to learn in it. In some cases, uh, kind of it was used as in preparation for, kind of for operations by their staff officers, but often commanders just ignored it um, uh, or just kind of passed on it untranslated to, uh, to the staff uh, officers. Also, the translation of the documents can t could take a very long time. So let's take uh, one uh, case of several kind of German documents from 1914 that I found in collection of a Russian staff officer um, who uh, was a staff officer in the 11th Corps on the Southwestern Front, who was assigned there in 1915. Well. It was one of the first batch of documents he received. So in August, there was a, uh, several orders from German 8th, 9th Army and 11th Corps they were uh, issued in August, September 1914. It was seized by the Russians sometime in late 1914. I think it varies. It was seized and then it was sent to the intelligence unit of the Northwestern Front because Northwestern Front was fighting, obviously, Germany in, uh, in East Prussia and Poland. And that's where the German 8th and 9th Army were fighting at the time. So kind of in the process of fighting, they acquired these documents, sent it to the intelligence unit. The intelligence officer in the intelligence unit look at it and he thinks, okay, that's interesting. He starts translating it. He translates it by hand, shows it to his superior. The superior decides that it, it's useful to send to the kind of to the lower level units, so armies and corps. Then they print it with the because it, each um, front and uh, army headquarters had their own printing office, obviously to print 
orders, but also manuals and instructions. They decided to print it and they sent it down to the troops in February 1915. At the same time, they sent copies of this kind of set of manuals, about four or five of them. They sent the copy to Stavka for, the Stavka, for Stavka to review it, and if they found it interesting, they could send it over. And in fact, in Stavka, it just lies there for months until they look at it and think, okay, that's actually quite useful. And then in late 1915, it's already after the change of command in Stavka, after the creation of special unit, there was doing kind of responsible for, ma uh, for manuals and training that they sent it down to the Southwestern Front. So from one front to another, it took about a year to kind of to reach there, kind of to share uh, this information. And if you're interested, what was in those orders, actually quite relevant information, for instance, how to avoid friendly fire, how to mark your own kind of infantry in, in an attack, guidance on how to contact an attack on field fortifications, including highlighting the importance of coordinating actions between infantry and uh, artillery, including the use of preliminary bombardment that many Russian commanders at the time ignored. So something that was kind of standard practice but in the German and the, uh, and the French and the British armies by 1915 was still quite contested. Um, in, in the Russian army. So, for instance, in Przemysl in 1914, the infantry was used not as a preliminary bombardment, but as an, in, kind of, as an instrument to suppress the enemy infantry inside the forts before the, the Russian infantry can approach and then storm, uh, storm the forts, which, as, as we know, didn't go very well. Um, and there is nothing, there is no better example of kind of the, this... Um, uh, complacent attitudes to, to artillery that survived through the first year of the war, then an order by General Evett, then commander of the 4th Army, uh, in May 1915, so during, in the middle of the Great Retreat, so he writes that the, in, in, the, in his uh, order that the preliminary bombardment as a separate act of command has outlived its time and leads only to a necessary waste of shells, since the enemy will hide in the trenches for this time. Our long experience proves how few losses we suffered despite the fact the enemy spared no ammunition. Artillery must fall on the enemy with all its force simultaneously with the advance of infantry. It was a very contested question, actually, that this uh, kind of when, when to use artillery in the Russian army. So you see it in 1916 uh, as well, kind of they, they're still debating it, but because there was no kind of unified guidance, no authority who can kind of come and say, okay, we're now all going to kind of use this approach or another approach, there was still kind of uh, a variety um, uh, of uh, thoughts and opinions um, on uh, the matter. So uh, it, um, actually it also shows what the Germans were doing in, in, in 1915 during the Great Retreat. So um, because the Germans were using the same tactics they were using on uh, the Western Front. So there was a big artillery bombardment that preceded the, uh, the, the infantry attack. It was uh, lots of artillery pieces were moved from the Western Front. However, the, the density uh, on the Eastern Front was never the same, was never comparable uh, to the Western Front. And kind of lots of fighting, as kind of the Russians were putting it, lots of fighting was done by the artillery on the, German, on the German side. And they had a big effect on Russians' morale, who didn't have at the time, didn't have artillery, who was able to kind of match up kind of the, the German artillery, and they were suffering from several munition shortages. And because they didn't have any artillery, which was kind of, because in, on the Western Front there was certain parity, uh, on the Eastern Front, Russians didn't have an artillery, so they had to fall back. So in fact, if not for uh, kind of my thoughts is that if, um, obviously kind of, if Russia had enough artillery, very likely the trench warfare would have set up on the Eastern Front much uh, um, earlier, so probably early 1915. Uh, as well, so that's uh, the Great Retreat that gives you the idea of how, how long that continued, but actually the, the Great Retreat is a good example of the Russian infantry tactics as well, because lots of uh, the units that were kind of retreating, or retreating, kind of uh, fighting rearguard um, uh, action, uh, that allowed kind of for the for the units to survive, even though they suffered uh, severe casualties, and it was pr pretty much the end of the Russian professional army uh, after after the Great Retreat in uh, August 1915. So some numbers put the Russian casualties to. Uh, million uh, men, sometimes even uh, million, uh, 1.2 million men uh, that were destroyed during the Great Retreat, but the German casualties, were, if not comparable, were also quite heavy, so the Great Retreat ended for one of those reasons, and also the ability of the Russians to regroup and counterattack uh, 
uh, the Germans in the northwest kind of flank of, of the Polish salient. The, I don't know about the time because I didn't manage to put it five minutes. Excellent. So the change only came with the change. So that kind of gives you an idea what the Russian positions looked like in 1915. So it's a, obviously it's a cavalry regiment that was put into uh, kind of was used as a as an infantry regiment. But again, it's not kind of not quite trench uh, like a warfare. So the change came only with the change of the high command. So after the Great Retreat in August 1915, General uh, uh, well, Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich and General Danilov and General Yanushkevich, who were part of his staff, were dismissed. The supreme command was assumed by the Emperor Nicholas II himself and General Alexeyev, who I already mentioned uh, here. He became the chief of staff of the Russian, of the field headquarters of the Russian supreme commander. So quite uh, quite a mouthful, but in fact, he was the head of Stavka and de facto kind of the, the, uh, the head of the Russian army at the time because uh, Nicholas II had more of a symbolic role at the time. And General Alexeyev came kind of with a more kind of open mind towards learning uh, from the Allies and kind of creating a unified guidance for, for all of the troops. So, uh, with his ascent to Stavka in August 1915, uh, Russia sent several special missions to France, so because they were thinking that, okay, well, they're getting lots of the French guidance, but might be a good idea to send someone with experience of fighting on the Eastern Front to send them to France and to see what they, what they have to say. This is one of the first missions led, led by Colonel Krivenko in autumn 1915. Russia also didn't have a good idea of what this strange fighting in France looks like. So for, uh, for a very long time in 1915, during the Great Retreat, when Russia was sending kind of requests for the Allies to help to mount an offensive in the, uh, in the West, they were thinking, and even though the actions, the actions were happening, but the, the French and the British were not really advancing, they were thinking that that's because they were not decisive enough and they, 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 they're sparing the infantry too much. So, so that, because they didn't have a good idea of what this actual trench fighting looked like at the time. So that's the reports that the missions, uh, that the missions uh, wrote as a result of their trip. Uh, so they were used as actually manuals. They were sent to the commanders up to the core level at the time. And more, more, most importantly, the, uh, at the time of General Alexe uh, at his time in Stavka, General Alexeyev made the reform of the Russian field headquarters, creating a special department that was working on the manuals and instructions for the Russian troops. And his first kind of big uh, project was creating of the general instructions for the attack of the fortified lines that was compiled in February 1916 and uh, kind of accepted in April uh, 1916, just before kind of big uh, Russian, uh, big offensive uh, on the Eastern Front. However, obviously there was not a smooth sailing even after the change of command and uh, lots, of the, kind of, lots of the lessons had to be learned in practice and the first two kind of trench offensive that Russia tried to mount on the Eastern Front in, on the River Stripper in, so on the, in the Carpathian Mountains in uh, December 1915 and uh, around the Lake Narach in uh, March 1916, they cost 70,000 or 78,000 casualties respectively. So it's quite, quite a costly kind of learning process. But again, what changed is that the, after those failures, the work kind of attempts to process the failures and to send the reports about why, they, why the Russian command thought that those attacks failed to at least kind of uh, front armies and sometimes even core, uh, core commanders. So to kind of go to the conclusion, so that's what the trenches looked like in 1916. So it's quite, quite a change. Actually, so they tried to adopt this new trench warfare, and you notice that even in 1916, no, one's, no one's wearing helmets because they didn't have a capacity to produce helmets. So what they did, they created, um, what do you call it? Basically like a wooden cover for the trenches. So Russian trenches were covered to protect their heads uh, because they were already in 1915, they started notice, not obviously noticing the, the uh, the effect that the artillery had uh, and on and the kind of on uh, and the rising number of head injuries. So going to the conclusions, I know that the talk was supposed to be on innovation and learning in the Russian army, but it turned out to be a talk more about lack of innovation and learning in the Russian army in 1914 and um, 1915. Um, and it's uh, kind of most uh, kind of shows that the Russian command structure. They existed, made it difficult to create any uniform guidance and 
uh, gave uh, too much power, delegated too much power to the low, low levels of command, that, that opened the possibility to different approaches to the new challenges of war. And obviously the factionalism that existed in the Russian army meant that these approaches were radically different. So some of the kind of, for instance, proponents of the Russian national schools could be, you know, attached to these uh, infantry attacks even after kind of the, the trench warfare set in in 1916. And some of those who were kind of more Western oriented were, able, were kind of were ready to use the information that was coming from the Allies and from the Germans to kind of to adapt. So in this uh, to this new type of warfare, so that led to different, obviously different uh, outcomes and different performance uh, of uh, different. Uh, uh, units and uh, Stavka, and especially the Stavka of Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich and uh, General Danilov and General Yanushkevich, who were his kind of closest advisors, was not proactive enough and didn't recognize the importance of creating this kind of unified guidance and didn't see the the changes that the, already this new warfare uh, brought uh, already. Uh, even on the Eastern Front, already in 1914, preferring, so preferring to ignore the evidence that was readily um, available to them. And uh, kind of to, to conclude with this kind of ideas of the role of the commanders, in many cases for the Russian army, it was a difference, uh, the, the, the presence of the capable and competent uh, commander was a difference, uh, created a significant difference in, in the, uh, in the unit performance and I think if we had a little bit more time kind of the role of General Brusilov and his personal kind of interventions and decisions to prepare for the for the Russian attack in 1916 had a key role more than more than anything more than the existence of the, actually the unified guidance that the staff could already provided at the time so thank you very much uh, for your attention I have, a, I have a slide for that so with my contact details and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions and the self-predominant is Hollywood. Man was